Hello, welcome to another edition of Seaside Chat here at Salve Regina University in amazing and beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. And today we are talking about writing and creative writing and the opportunity to get your voice out into the world through the Newport MFA program. And I've got a wonderful panel of guests with me to discuss opportunities available to prospective students to come to Salve to experience the uh, really uh, wonderful environment that we have here and to uh, learn how to craft your story in a way that will be useful not only to your own personal development but to allow you to share your story with the greater world. And with me today uh, we have Ann Hood who is the founding director of the MF Newport MFA program, uh, Dr. Jen McClanahan who is the current program director for the program, uh, Katie Hughes Pucci who is a graduate of the program as well as Tom Cowan who is also a graduate of the program. Program. Uh, and to start with, let's start with you, Anne. Could, could you talk a little bit about what led you to want to start an MFA program? You're an award winning author, you uh, have a wonderful uh, litany of published works and, and a full career uh, as, a, as, a, as a working author. But why an MFA program and why an MFA program at Salve? So I was actually approached by Salve about 15 years ago now, I think. Um, to see if I'd be willing to start a low residency MFA program here. And I think that's an important point to make. Uh, the traditional MFA, you have to move for two or three years to the college, town, or city, um, kind of uproot your life um, to dedicate yourself to getting that MFA. But a low residency model, I'm really a big fan of because it allows people with children uh, people with jobs they can't leave, people who are taking care of their parents, or people who just want to stay in their hometown or city to still get an MFA by coming to campus just twice a year for eight days each time, and then working one-on-one -on -one with faculty via email or in telephones and, you know, the way we do it now. Um, but I love that model. So when I was asked to develop one, I just jumped on it because I had taught in so, so many low residency programs and I saw how valuable they were for people who want that MFA but just can't change their lives mm -hmm. um, in the way that traditional programs ask you to. Yeah. Uh, so what I was able to do is take all the things I loved from all those low residency programs but fix all the things I didn't love so much <laughs> yeah. to create the perfect one. And, and what in your mind makes Salve such a good place to have an MFA program? Well, first of all, who doesn't want to be on this campus? It's the <laughs> most beautiful campus, I think. I think it even shows up in like top 50 beautiful campuses in the country. Uh, but also, Newport has such a history, a literary history. And um, I think students kind of connect with that. Also, we just have a great faculty. You know, people want to work with this book faculty that we have because they are award-winning, best-selling writers and award-winning teachers. You know, you have to find those people who are both of those things. Mm -hmm. And we have them for sure. Uh, one of the things we do that is different is we bring guest writers in every residency. Most low residency MFA programs just stick with their faculty. So that could be you're with six people for two or three years. And that can be a little claustrophobic no matter how wonderful they are. But we always bring in two to four guests who really open up the program, inspire our students, and really challenge them in new ways and inspire mm -hmm. them in new ways. So let me turn to Dr. McClanahan here. And Jen, talk to me a little bit about the structure of the program and how the program is structured to help somebody that, you know, I, I would think that someone that wants to do an MFA has a goal of publishing, has a goal of writing, has a goal of, of getting their work out into the world. So how do we help them in that process? That's a great question. I think a lot of it has to do with the award-winning faculty mm -hmm. that Anne talked about. Because they're such great writers, but also fabulous teachers, they can create a class that has all skill levels. So we have very advanced writers who have lots of experience in the workshop setting or have been writing for a very long time. And we have other people who are in industry or you know, some other job or position, this was their dream, so they're newer to the process. And so I think our teachers are so great at managing the classroom and really making an experience for everyone where everyone feels challenged. 
So I think that's one thing. I think that's really important. Um, I don't think you can underscore that enough. And then in terms of the structure, as Anne said, we have this great low residency model. So not only do we have this like this week where we have this great classroom that's set up, but also all of these fabulous guests that come, as Anne said. So we're professionalizing students. We had a literary magazine panel and some students just off the cuff got to pitch, this was just last night, got to pitch you know, an idea for a magazine article and they got feedback on it. So mm -hmm. that sort of experience also helped shape you know, a student's trajectory. Um, and yeah, I think those are the two things I'd say. And then again, just going back to the low residency model, um, not only are you here for the classroom experience, but then working one-on-one -on -one with these writers and, and really digging into what is your what are your goals for the two years that you're here and how can we help meet those goals and really getting individualized <coughs> attention, I think is a huge part of mm -hmm. what makes mm -hmm. this work so well. What is the expectation between residency and then time away where you're working either independently or in concert with your faculty mentors? So the expectation in terms of the workload or how yeah. does it look? Right, so fully immersive week when you're here on campus and then when you before you leave campus, you meet with your faculty mentor and that's the person you'll work one-on-one -on -one with. You come up with a reading list um, of books that you've always either wanted to read to help you with the project that you wanna work on, or books that your mentor says, that you're working on this project, I think you'd love reading this book. And sometimes you'll have some craft books, but it's all individualized. Um, so then you leave, you have these books that you're working on, and you come to campus in June and January, and otherwise in the months in between, so you have four months really, or four and a half months, um, in which you're reading the books and you're working on your own creative project. You're also writing annotations in response to the book, so you have, mm -hmm. you're have deepening your critical knowledge and mm -hmm. your understanding mm -hmm. of craft, and then you're able to apply that to the creative work that you're doing. So, and you have to, um, you know, students usually turn in, in prose 20 to 25 pages. So they a might month. have a month, yeah. right? So you might have 100 <laughs> pages, and we ask that as students go forward, they keep creating new work. Mm -hmm. um, and then the revision will come later on, but we really want students to feel like they've produced a lot of work mm -hmm. um, you know, toward their project before they leave. Well, and that's the, sort of the great mystery of writing to non-writers, right? Is how, how do you, you know, create this novel? How do you create this piece of work? And I think that the, the great thing that people that don't write regularly don't understand is you're, you're actually, you have a lot on the cutting room floor, you know, in order to do, be a great writing, in order to produce something, you've got to keep producing and not everything that you're going to produce is going to be that gem, but that process is going to lead to that next thing. So we're facilitating that process, yeah, it sounds absolutely. like. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so let me turn to you, Katie, sure. uh, as, as a recent alum sure. of, the, of the program. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, one, why you chose this program and what your experience was like within the program? Sure. So I graduated my, my, with my bachelor's a number of years ago. <laughs> we, don't need to, we don't need to talk about that. Um, and at that time in my life, I was pulled into a caretaking role with some family members. And I didn't get to go right into grad school like a lot of my friends did. Uh, a lot of them went into the traditional three-year MFA programs or other graduate programs. And I just figured, oh, oh well, that's, <laughs> you know, I, I won't be able to do that. And I, I kind of just wrote off that dream of mine to hone this writing skill um, that I had, you know, built up over the years. And then this program kind of came across my desk and I was intrigued by the low residency format because at that point I was married, I had a house, um, we were, you know, family planning and, 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 you know, wanting to start a family. I had a full-time job that, you know, was, was a great job and I loved it. Um, and so I knew I wanted to find something that could fit into all of that. Yeah. And so, like Anne had mentioned earlier, the low residency option was absolutely the way to go. And then in terms of why Salve, it's in my backyard. <laughs> um, I'm a Rhode Islander, so it was really convenient. Like, it couldn't have been more convenient. And on top of that, Anne has this uncanny ability mm -hmm. uh, to collect wonderful people in her pocket. She just, she grabs them wherever she goes, <laughs> and and she collects these fantastic, uh, you know, award-winning and published and um, constantly working writers. These are people who are actively working in the industry, who have 
the background information, the insider information. These aren't people who have been, you know, stuck in an academic setting uh, for umpteen years who come out, you know, during the semester to teach. These are people who are constantly publishing in the New York Times. They're publishing in the Washington Journal. Um, they're, they're publishing books that on the New York Times bestseller list. These are people who are living and breathing the craft. And I knew I wanted to work with those people. Uh, so it was, it was a very natural uh, fit for me. It, it ticked all the different boxes for me. Yeah. I imagine if you wanted to figure out how she goes about doing that, read Fly Girl. Her <laughs> <laughs> where she, it's very obvious where she developed those skills of sort of being oh. able to gobble people oh, yeah. up. Absolutely. <laughs> trained. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, um, so now you're, uh, you're, you're writing, you're, you're a graduate of the program, um, and it sounds like that you've done some work both on nonfiction writing, but you're also a satirist. Talk yeah, a little bit about yeah. sort of how the program helped you develop the skills to be able to navigate different yeah. genres of writing and, and really pick and choose what works for you. Yeah, I think the program uh, demystified the publishing process in general for me. I think I, I came into the program a little nervous. It had been a little while since I had been in the classroom. Um, I had imposter syndrome. I was, <laughs> right. I was a little like, oh, I, I mean, I like to write. I've, I've gotten good feedback from friends and some some professionals, but I wasn't sure if this was going to work for me. Mm -hmm. And and just coming here, I was able to to hear like you know the curtain was pulled back and 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 folks telling me this is how you you pitch an article or pitch an idea here are all of these literary journals that i had never heard of or that i had heard of but i didn't realize how accessible they were to to submit to right and um with the different genres what's great about this program in particular mm -hmm. is that we're we're with each other the whole time. You're not in a silo with your nonfiction folks right. or your fiction folks or your poetry folks. You're not you're not just squirreled away with, with that smaller cohort for the week. You're yeah. in conversation with all of these people and all of these faculty members. And so I was able to talk with the poets. I was able to talk with the fiction writers and decide how could I incorporate, you know, some of these skills into my writing. And I think the fiction writing, I always thought, oh, I'm going to be a nonfiction writer, and I love nonfiction, but I think the fiction writing taught me how to introduce some of that satire mm -hmm. writing, how to lean into some of my comedic <laughs> inclinations <laughs> uh, and, and, and make them into this work of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that was really kind of the, the germ for what has become you know, a really fun and, and rewarding writing life. Well, that, that I certainly have seen the evolution of nonfiction writing over the course of my life where, you know, it used to be nonfiction writing was, was very straightforward. Right. It's very, you know, here's a fact, we're going to talk about the fact. Right. And now there's much more novella approach right. to writing because you want to keep people engaged. You don't want to just deliver, okay, here's some dry factual information. You want to be able to tell the story of that information. I, so I can see how that connectivity between mm -hmm. the fiction and the nonfiction is, is just as important. Where are some places that people may have seen some of your work? Uh, so the satire writing I have um, published in, in the McSweeney's Internet Tendencies yeah. website. So <laughs> McSweeney's really is, really is a, a fun satire website. Also, the Belladonna's comedy mm. um, that is a, uh, a women and women identified um, written pieces for everybody. Uh, and then also Slackjaw, which is another satire website. Um, in addition to that, I have also had a literary interview published through The Millions. Oh, that wow. one I actually yeah. interviewed Alden Jones, who's yeah. a faculty member here uh, in her for her upcoming, well, for previously upcoming book, it's now out, uh, and was able to engage in conversation with her and have that published. Uh, and so really, I've been able to to uh, pivot from, from one genre to another very smoothly, and uh, I look forward to continuing that. You've also been able to parlay some of that into uh, teaching at the college level. That's right. That's right. So one of the, the perks of of an MFA in general is that it's a terminal degree and it affords you the opportunity to qualify 
for a professorship at most universities. And then getting the MFA from Salve, I was able to work actually with, alongside Jen afterwards um, to shadow her in the classroom for a, a class or two. And then I've been able to work at Community College of Rhode Island. I work currently at Providence College as an adjunct. I came back here actually last spring, uh, or not last spring, the spring before that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, the, right. The fall before that yeah. um, to teach while while Jen was on sabbatical. I taught a, a humor writing a humor, class. A special yeah. topic. You know, for Katie. Topic. Really it was nice. for Katie. Was great. Yeah. Right. So I got to teach the undergraduate students here, which was such a gift to come yeah. back. To, and to my stomping <laughs> grounds and, and, and teach them things that I was passionate about. Um, so, so having that MFA now has, has helped me leverage my career. I was working in higher ed on the administration side before in student affairs, but now I pivoted and now I'm in the fac, I'm on the faculty side of things, which is where I always wanted to eventually end up. I just didn't know it was going to be possible. <laughs> yeah. And Tom, let, let's turn to you and talk a little bit about your story. What, what is it that sure. ultimately led you to decide it's time for an MFA? Yeah, kind of a couple of things. It's interesting listening to Katie. I, I think you know very similar in some ways and, and different. I would, I'm actually a, a business person, so I you know work in Silicon Valley, work a pretty demanding job. Was always a lifelong reader, read a lot, um, and then my I had a younger son passed away from cancer, um, and I started reading more and more and then one day just began writing. I had never never written and um, started taking some workshops. I live in Connecticut, so down in that area. Enjoyed those, was getting a lot out of those, and but still felt I needed to bring my writing to, a, to another level. And somewhere I found out about, started looking into MFAs, found out about low residency MFAs and knew that was really the only kind, kind of MFA I could go and do. Mm -hmm and came across Salve. And kind of the other thread of that story was yeah. Newport always had a special meaning yeah. to my wife and I and our family. Uh, we actually got engaged on the cliff walk. <laughs> oh, wow. Right down from the 40 steps. So, yeah. yeah, so just back over there, yeah. I proposed. And um, we've been married 30 years now. But wow. um, so Newport always had just a magical mm -hmm. uh, you know, feeling to us. And we'd come back at least once a year. Uh, and then I started to read about the program, read about Anne, and also had lost lost a child, um, lost her daughter. And I wrote Anne an email, actually read her book, Comfort, mm -hmm. from cover to cover the night before, and uh, read it, wrote her an email, and we, we just had a lot in common, and, and I really knew at that point it was the only place I wanted to go. Then I had to convince my wife at, you know, 55 years old to go and <laughs> right. I'm going back to school. Right. And, Surprise. And, uh, yeah. Then I just had numerous calls with Jen. Yeah. Drove her crazy, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and she was just oh. fabulous, gave me all the time that I needed. And yeah. uh, and then I just signed up one May and, and got started. Yeah. So what, what were some of your goals when you, when you entered the MFA in terms of your writing and what you hope to accomplish? And have you been able to accomplish those as a result? Yeah, yeah, I think certainly, um, you know, really went at it. I think a lot of people come in with, you know, big, long form project coming in. So I've been able to move move that project along. Um, but along the way, really had a number of essays published. So uh, Bernadette Murphy, who was one of my mentors during one of the, uh, you know, four or five month periods in between, you know, she, she looked at the longer work and said, let's bring that back and let's let's start off with an essay. We, we really went to the shorter form which really just taught me a tremendous amount in terms of revising and working on things and getting thoughts across. And, and it's really turned into something I really, really enjoy. Yeah. Well, I think your story <laughs> as someone who w was in the business world and still in the business world, but wants to explore that more creative aspect of themselves through writing um, is not an unusual one. I think there's a lot of people out there that, um, you know, sort of see themselves as having this unfulfilled desire to share their ideas, share their thoughts, to share their story, whether it's in a, in a memoir or in, in some other form. You you know, what would you say to other professionals who you know are in business or uh, you know trying to decide how do I balance this and do I you know go get an MFA? Do I just start writing? What do I do? 
Yeah, I, I think I would, if you haven't done anything, I'd say probably start with some workshops. You know, uh, I live in Fairfield County down in uh, Connecticut, and uh, we have a Westport Writers Workshop, mm -hmm. which has been great. Got able to, you know, so get introduced to that process, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of work, workshopping your, your work and make sure you can take the feedback. Right. Um, but then really jump into it. And, you know, sometimes it's these major life events that push people to do that. But yeah, a lot, of, I hear that from a lot of people that they, they're in the business world, but they, they want to go and do these types of things, yeah. express themselves in different ways. So I, I would say just just go for it. And the, the low residency MFA is really, you know, people still need to continue working and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, yep. just a great way to go about it. I mean, as Jen said, it's, a, it's an immersive, you know, week to nine days and, and you're just <laughs> in it and you're so inspired. And every residency I've come out of it with with an idea that I think ultimately became an essay. And, yeah. and uh, you know, you end up with just so many ideas swirling that, that you just want to get going into that next yeah. next stretch of it directly with your mentors. Yeah. Well, that, that sort of feeds into something I wanted to ask Ann about, which is, you know, you're a successful writer. You've, you've had a number of novels published. You're well known. Um, if somebody were to say to you, I want to be a writer, I have an idea. I feel like I'm a good writer. Why bother getting an MFA? I'm just going to go out and do it. Why, ch why choose to do an MFA? You know, although there are people in the world, people out there who write in a vacuum, they live in a cabin somewhere and they produce some brilliant book, that's very rare. I always was a little jealous of people who had MFAs because I wasn't able to do it. And the, the low residency model wasn't really around when I yeah. when I started writing. So I either had to do a traditional MFA, which would mean quitting my job yeah. um, and leaving where I love to live, um, or I, I just had to do it on my own, and it was hard. And so I think, wow, there, there's a low residency program in Newport, Rhode Island, like, why not do it? Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna get feedback, you're gonna sit in a workshop environment, so you're getting you know, feedback from your peers as well as from your faculty members. And you're listening to writers that you've read and admire come to give readings and talks. Um, it's a really um, immersive, yes, intense week, but you just leave so inspired. And then you do go off and write, you know, but mm -hmm. so you get a little of both in a way. Sure. Right. Um, as I said, I was always jealous that people got MFAs and I was like, I can't do, I can't afford to do yeah. that. Uh, because I think there was one low residence program back in the olden days when I started. Yeah. So uh, it was just not in the cards for me. Yeah. Um, but I think to be able to make that available for everyone now is really exciting. Well, and I think, you know, anytime you're talking any art, you know, whether it's I'm theater and music, whether it's visual art, whether it's writing, the best art is always produced when you have other people Definitely. that can be part of that process. Yeah. Right. If you're doing it in isolation, you're you're sort of limited in your scope, you're limited in feedback, and, and you know, as to what Tom, Tom was talking about, being able to come together with an idea with a bunch of different people around the table to say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you considered this? It really, you know, I often think about, um, you know, a fun experience I had in traveling to England at one point in time, was going to the British Museum and, and seeing a manuscript of James Joyce. Mm -hmm. And you read James Joyce and you, you think about the stream of consciousness writers and you, and you think, oh, well, they just sat down and wrote. That's the whole stream of consciousness thing. And you see this manuscript with all these red X's and, <laughs> yes, you yes. know, arrows pointing everywhere and stuff yeah. moved around. You're like, okay, there was a process yeah. to this. And the MFA is about creating that process and helping people to navigate that process and know how to take a really good idea, but to really make it work in a way that's hard to do on your own. Right. You know, I, I think Tom is actually a great example of one of the things that the MFA makes possible, one of many things. When I was starting out, not in an MFA program, just working my job, living my life, writing, you know, secretly on my kitchen table, I used to send things out, but it was like kind of throwing spaghetti against a wall mm -hmm. to see if it would stick because I didn't have any connection to any editors or <clears throat> magazines or literary journals. Um, you know, and I got a lot of rejections. But we had a panel of literary journal editors come, and one was from the very prestigious Post Road, and Tom met that editor at a residency. And will you tell the story, Tom? Yeah, so Alden Jones ran a, a great seminar, and I, and I remember it now, and she also talked about how to submit your essay. Yeah. She went through that whole process with us, and I followed that and wrote it all down. And uh, 
the editor of Agne spoke. Um, so there's, it's Boston College and Boston University's literary magazines mm -hmm. and Post Road. So I um, submitted to both, um, you know, over, over the past year, several several essays. And the editor you know, really liked another essay I wrote, but just wasn't right at that point. Yeah. And uh, asked me to submit again to them and uh, kept in touch with these guys. And mm -hmm. they just accepted one of my essays is going to run in their very next issue, and it's wow. been nominated now for a Pushcart Prize. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so. Yeah. Right. so that's the kind of thing that doesn't happen when you're sitting alone right. in your kitchen. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> or the editor of Coastal Lake saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. let me hear your pitch. Go yeah, ahead. right. Yeah. Last yeah. night we oh, had yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I think something else that's really helpful for um, the, the MFA program itself is, is the structure. Uh, I am somebody who loves to write, but if you don't give me a deadline, if you don't give me some kind of rubric to follow, I might do 20 pages of writing on one day and then nothing for three months and then pick it up again. And so what the MFA program here taught me, it was how to really build a writing life and a yeah. structure mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, talk to different writers and, and ask them and, and interview them really. What, what's your writing life? Like, you know, some folks were, I get up every day, I write at the same time every day, but then also hearing, you know, from others, like even talking with you, Anne, like has, has a little bit more flexibility with your writing schedule, but you still make time for it. Mm -hmm. And so finding out, uh, how other people make time for writing in their life really helped me craft a schedule and a discipline that I would not have been able to do without a program like the MFA. Yeah. Well, and I hear this a lot in a lot of different professions today, the idea of not just having mentors that can help you with content, but also just with the day-to-day, -day, making sure you're holding each other accountable right. to Absolutely. do those things. And so I am, it sounds like what you've developed is, is sort of this professional network mm -hmm. of not only people that have this same passion to write and to share their ideas, but also can help each other along the way with the little push or nudge that you each need from time to time mm -hmm. to say, right. hey, you need to keep going. Like if you stop, you're going to stop. You've got to yeah. keep it. And, and having that, that deadline, that monthly deadline of I know I have to get my pay pages in. I have to get my creative pages in and I also have to get my, my reading in. I have to like having that, um, you know, in the back of your brain really makes you make time for it in your schedule. You know, I ended up having to carve out time plopping it into my calendar. This is my reading time. Yeah. This is mm -hmm. my, this is my writing time. And, and, um, I think it was, it was, uh, one of our faculty member, Bill Warbach, mm -hmm. who, who said, you need to treat it like it's it's work. Uh, honor it like it's it's your work. You know, not treat it like it's work difficult, mm -hmm. but treat it like uh, you know, give it the same respect that you yes. give your career. So if I'm going to work from nine to five, I'm also going to work go to work <laughs> from six to eight in my desk. You know, in my computer, but I'm going to give it the same respect that I give. The work that I do during the day, and it's not a—it's not a side thing. It's not a little hobby on the side. Right. But by doing that, you—you're honoring yourself as the writer, and you're—you're you're putting more intention into the work itself. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. definitely validating. You know, I think when you come to this mm -hmm. program, yes. everybody respects you as a writer, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. when it's your first day here. Mm -hmm. um, you're here to write, and we respect that, and we want to help you do that better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and I think a lot for me was, you know, just learning to respect the craft, right, mm -hmm. and, and really being with our mentors who were professional writers and, and deal with it as a profession, right, and, and have an appreciation for that craft. I thought I was pretty well read, but then Anna's read every book there <laughs> is, and true. Bernadette yes. Murphy, and Tim Weed, and it's, it's right. just incredible yeah. what, yeah. you know, and they're reading to learn, you, you need, if you want to be a writer, you need to read. Well, <laughs> I think, I think so. for a, a lot of, you know, just general intellectual people, but also, you know, people that envision themselves as being a writer, there's a natural imposter syndrome for many of us that comes forth, where you may be thinking to yourself, Am I really smart enough? Am I really a good enough writer to pr pursue an MFA? And I think what I'm hearing is if you're even remotely a writer, yes, you're smart enough. You have the ability. You just need 
you need some structure. You need some yeah. some people that are going to help guide you and develop yes. you. But that you know your potential exists. Absolutely. Take advantage of it and and take that as an opportunity. Yes, yes. absolutely. And yeah. and as Jen pointed out, we have students at every level of writing. Yeah. Yeah. Some are right out of college. Some waited. You know, they had a whole life that they've lived before, and they're finally getting this yeah. opportunity. <clears throat> Some are burning to tell a story, like in a memoir. And um, what a gift that is for a student right. coming into a cohort where we have people who are mid-career professionals who have are retired and this is something that they've, they've gravitated towards later in life, who are right out of college. So many different perspectives yes. around the table coming together and listening to each other's work. It was so rewarding having multi-generations yes. coming yeah. To, to look at work and ask questions and really help you uh, understand your own work a little bit more through the lens of somebody else's perspective. Yes. Well, that's the, that's the beauty of the written form is there's everyone's voice has value. Everyone's mm -hmm. voice, regardless of whether it's someone that has limited experience yeah. in terms of years and someone that, you know, is in their 80s or their 90s and are yeah. writing that final memoir. You know, there, there's there's a need for all of that. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds like we're creating a structure for that. Jen, let me just turn back to you with sort of some of the just thinking about people watching this and trying yeah. to decide, one, do I apply to Salve? And two, what is Salve looking for? Um, yes, you, you know, apply to Salve, <laughs> of course. <laughs> know, but, but, but what type of student do you think is sort of the ideal student for this program? And, and what, should yeah. they, what should they, how should they approach this process? Um, I think there's not necessarily an ideal student. And I think one of the things that we've touched on but we haven't really said is that another, you need the structure and you need the professionalism, you need the good faculty, but this program always has a spark and it's, mm -hmm. it happens every cohort and every time. Yeah. And I think that the spark that happens is the way that we build this cohort experience here. It's being on this beautiful campus, it's mm -hmm. being with this faculty, but we're also able to create events in which students really get to be close with each other. We stay in dorms together, Anne and I stay in the dorms. <laughs> yeah, we're there. there. We stay at a hotel, in the, a beautiful hotel in the winter because we can't be on campus. And that's a huge part of this developing a respect for each other. So I think we welcome all students and anyone who is a reader, a writer, you know, writing curious, uh, someone who has a has had an event in their life and they really do want to write that book and talk about it, express it. Um, our poets, our fiction writers, we have people who do historical fiction, speculative fiction. We invite everyone. Um, so in terms of an ideal student, we're very welcoming and we're really good at building community with multi-generations <laughs> of students. Mm -hmm. So, um, And then in terms of just the application process, Anne and I make ourselves completely available to answer all questions by phone, by email, We, which is another thing about our program. Everyone's very accessible. Yes. You know, you said that you introduced, um, <clears throat> you interviewed Alden Jones, mm -hmm. one of our faculty members. Many faculty members make themselves incredibly available. Yeah. So it's not that they're here and that, oh, I'll see you when you turn in that packet. <laughs> they yes. turn in that packet of work and then faculty get on the phone with them. They yeah. Skype with them. Sometimes they'll meet for coffee. Let's talk about that packet that you turned in. So, yeah, it's just... Um, and it's just incredible. So in terms of up applying or asking questions, we're there to answer any questions. We have a great team at Salve that walk people through the process of putting in an application. Um, so I think we've We've got this down. <laughs> yeah, we got it down really well. And, and the application's yeah. online, right? The application's yes. online, and there's no application fee, right. which is another thing that yes. I think is really great. Yeah. Um, you can start. You can start the application, look to see what it looks like, and then you know you are going to want to get your writing together and your and the personal statement that you write. But you can start the application and really get a look at oh, what is it that you know we're looking for and asking for, and then Anne and I read the application. So you know it's not even that it happens in some other remote place. Right. It's a very very hands-on yeah. uh, program. And I know it, it, and had mentioned uh, affordability at one point about you know the accessibility of an MFA. A lot of people look at it and say, oh, gee, that's just too expensive. I think one of the things that we pride ourselves here, and it's inherent in our Mercy mission, is to try to make... Mm -hmm be as accessible as possible. And I think, you know, we've structured a program right. to, to try to make it more affordable than other options. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're looking all the time at how do we build, you know, more scholarships? How do we do things to really help students? Um, you know, and 
like we all know, think, everything's so expensive in the world today, right? <laughs> right. You know, so we're all, students are comfort. You know, that's always our thing. So how do we get students here? How do we get them to feel as though they're getting their money's worth? Because we know all education is expensive. And, you know, building up scholar, we have the Anne Hood Scholarship Fund mm -hmm. that is funded by students in, in large part who have already graduated that love the program so much, who mm -hmm. also come back not only for an event like this, and thank you both for being <laughs> here, but yes. they'll come back um, for other student yeah. meetings that happen at the end of the residency. I think, um, you know, we don't let them go and they don't <laughs> want to go. You know, I feel yeah. like that's true. Well, one of the things you're investing in, I think, mm -hmm. is a writing community that's yeah. going to go long past when you get your MFA. Yes. <laughs> One of the things I found in low residency MFAs, possibly because of the way the model is structured, is there was a lot, there wasn't a sense of community when you were mm -hmm. on that campus. Either faculty remained separate from students, or as Katie had pointed out, genres kind of stuck together. And when I had this great <clears throat> opportunity to start one here, I said, I want a community because being in a writing community is so important to me as a writer. So I know the value of it. And so we have events where faculty and students are together eating pizza or together right. at a cookout, um, you know, after a long night. Last night, the Viking Hotel where we stayed, the, the lobby was filled with alumni, students. Yeah. Our guests were all there. Everybody was accessible. If you wanted to go up to the coastal living editor and talk <laughs> to her more, there she was. Yeah. And so we really promote that. And yeah. you graduate here with a, with a family. Yeah. yeah. Well, it also sounds like we do a really strong job of making sure that we're connecting our authors with the publishing community, that that's embedded Absolutely. within the program. Yes. So it's it, because that's one of the big mysteries in all of this. Yes. So I think Absolutely. for a lot of writers is not just how do I put my ideas on paper, right. but then how do I connect my ideas to the people that ultimately will take them to the world? Yes. Yes. And I, and I think a, a key there is our proximity to, to New York and Boston too. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a train ride up mm -hmm. for many of the people that, that yes. Anne brings in. Yeah. You know, in the yeah. New York publishing community, great people from Boston coming down. Yeah. So this, this location here in Newport is just great. Yeah, a lot of MFA programs kind of pretend that there isn't a business side to this. <laughs> right. Yeah, you I know? was thinking that my very own, when I got an MFA, full residency MFA in New York City, it, we really did work on our craft, but I like it was a mystery to me how to send out work. So I, I graduated with that MFA. Yeah, so I deliberately, I bring in writers, yes, as yeah. guests, but I always have at least two people from the from the business, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Um, this residency, we're gonna focus on small presses. Um, and we have an award-winning poet who wrote his first novel and chose to have it published with a small press. So that publisher is coming here from Boston with that writer and talking to our students about, you know, maybe you don't need to publish or want to publish right. with a big, mm -hmm. you know, uh, New York publisher. Mm -hmm. right. Here's another option for you. Right. Oh, and yeah. even Katie gave that panel on. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. one of our yeah. facts. So interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not me, Katie. Publish your book with Audible. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So just, you know, we bring people that also say the market is changing in different ways, too. Mm -hmm. right? And let's how talk do we think about, about other outlets? As well as agents um, and editors from, we've had them from Norton, uh, Penguin, yeah. all over. I, you know, I just try to find the right. people who I think will inspire our students and help them. Well, and like so much of the world, sometimes it's just being able to get in the same room with somebody That's to make action. those connections. Yeah. And we're providing that opportunity. Yeah. that you wouldn't necessarily be able to right. create on your own. Yeah. yeah. Something really special about this program too is it's pandemic proof. <laughs> um, and, you know, unfortunately, the reality is is that we we you know lived through a time where we had to go virtual yes. for a couple of our residencies, but even that lent itself. This program lends itself to that so beautifully because we now were able to get people, um, some professionals from California or professionals yes. from the middle of the country who came in. And I, I remember we had, um, I think Courtney mom talking about her, her oh, book yeah. proposal process yes. and the book, um, how to write a book, how, proposal. how to write a book mm -hmm. proposal, her, which is a book that she wrote. And, and she was friends with one of the faculty members here who was able to do, you know, a quick hour and a half talk with us. Yeah. You know, there was something very, the way this program pivoted during, during COVID was, was remarkable for a number of reasons. I think something that Jen mentioned was that spark. How do we not lose that spark yeah, when yeah, you have to go virtual? Yeah. Well, Jen and Anne worked tirelessly to create these interstitial moments between the panel discussions, between the workshops, where different faculty members and different guests 
hosted these Zoom hangouts. So <laughs> yeah. there would be a drop in where, okay, I have an hour to kill between now and my next session. Let me hop on to this yeah. this coffee hour with with you know Bernadette or Danielle, Danielle, and craft and and you have access to these yeah. to these people who are you know having coffee, going for a walk. Bernadette would take us for a walk in her backyard, but then also answer questions that would demystify the publishing process or talk to us. Like I love hearing about how do you get out of a stuck situation with writer's block. What's your strategy? Yes, right. Just getting that kind of access. Uh, not only can you do that in person here, but you know it yeah. was it was so accessible even even during a, a time when we were socially distant. Yes. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And that was your idea because we students couldn't be on campus. And one thing that happens is the magic in between yeah. because right. everyone does spend time together. So faculty don't <clears throat> run off, you know, after they give their, their workshop or their craft lecture. We all stay, we have lunch in the cafeteria together. Yeah. But you said in the pandemic, when, we, when we're virtual, how do we replicate that walk from the classroom to the cafeteria? Right. How do we do that for students where they get to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or in a small group of the faculty member? So we were, eat, but we're always thinking, how do we make the greatest experience for exactly. students and the most connected experience for students? And our faculty mm -hmm. really rallied. Every Absolutely. one of them yeah. had these drop-ins and oh, yeah. came up with such inc uh, creative ways to invite yeah. you into their home or their office right. or tour their yeah. studios. Yes. Yeah. What, is your, right yes. what like, is your writing like, space? Yes. What is your writing space? What a gift like? that was. Yeah. That you can't do in person, right? right? So yeah. it was. It wasn't. Oh, we're doing this. Because as as a an afterthought, it's intentional. Yeah. What can we do now that we're virtual yes, that right. we wouldn't be able to do right. in yes. person? And so all of these other opportunities came forward, and I just thought it was it was such a rewarding experience as a student. And I know it's the kind of strategy that yeah. Jen and Anne approach each iteration of of cohort. You know, right. it, this they pivot on a dime. It's really it's really <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Yeah, well, man, my, my, it actually brought me closer to the faculty because, yeah. you know, we got to see their their writing spaces. So Bernadette had just moved from L.A. to Utah and we saw her new place. Yes. And, and Tim always talked about where he lived in Vermont and I got to see yeah. it. And right. Edgar, Edgar in us, Baltimore. Yeah, he yeah. gave us a and tour of his writing studio. <laughs> and it was in a yeah. smaller place yeah. and, you know, we got yes. to see where he, he went and, and did his work. And Bill so, gave us yeah. a nature walk, too, yeah. right. in Maine. Yeah. Well, while we end with this, which is... To you know, Tom and Katie, one, you know, would you chose the program again? And two, what advice would you give to someone that is looking to do an MFA, considering Salve, and why they should choose Salve? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, no, no regrets, no, no questions, in, in what I did, and and it just you know provided, me, you know, I learned so much more, evolved so much more. I got into poetry, and and just so much that 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 came out of it positive and it really made writing approachable I think this this yeah. program you know I had kind of looked around at a couple others and people should go and, and, and look at others yeah. um, but um, yeah just the freshness of this program you know the the mentors everybody who's here the campus is spectacular the <laughs> yeah. buildings are historic buildings right. they're bright and open that overlook you know an incredible bay and and yeah, it's just a magical place. Well, what better space for inspiration for a writer? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think um, would I would I change anything? No, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I think my advice for any student considering this is go to the info sessions if they're info sessions. Yeah. Watch any videos or snippets. Follow follow the program on social media. Um, get a little taste for it here and there, um, and mm -hmm. and reach out. You know, we, we've already said that, you know, Anne and Jen are very accessible. Reach out with questions. Um, even alumni, if you if you reach out to us, yes. I've, I've right. talked I've with, I've talked with yes. a handful of, of prospective students. Um, and, and then also, you know, decide, like, is, is this something you want to investigate? Don't feel like you have to be fully baked. <laughs> I yes, was not fully true. baked. I did not feel like I was a published author. I did not feel like I knew everything. I didn't feel, you know, I, I came in with this imposter syndrome. That's good. <laughs> you you want to come into this with that sponge-like ability to just soak it all in mm -hmm. um, and, and really see it as an invigorating experience and not something to shy away from. 
Well, thank you all for taking the time thank to you. speak today about the Newport MFA. If you want to learn more about the Newport MFA program, please contact us. We have a great staff in the Office of Admissions yeah. that is willing to point you in the right direction and help you learn more about this incredible opportunity to develop yourself and ultimately uh, have a program that's going to help you to achieve your personal and professional goals. And we certainly hope to see you on campus at one of our readings or one of our other events related to the Newport MFA sometime in the future. Thank you very much.